Well, we are expecting a contested race for the speakership. There are nine candidates who are running for this, trying to get a majority of the conference vote tomorrow to be nominated as speaker. The challenge will be which one of them gets nominated can get the 217 votes they need on the House floor to be elected, something that has not happened yet in the almost three weeks since Kevin McCarthy's ouster. I am here with one of those candidates, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma, who's the chairman of the Republican Study Committee. Uh, Congressman, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. You've been on the phone all weekend long trying to get the votes from your colleagues. What specifically is the pitch you're making, and how do you distinguish yourself from some of the members here in this race? Well, certainly everybody is going to tell all the members that they believe they're the candidate can reunite the party and bring us together. The question will be is how each of us present our experiences to make that happen. I chair the Republican Study Committee, and it's made up of the House Freedom Caucus, the Problem Solvers, Main Street, and Republican Governance. And what that is, that's all the caucuses of the Republican Party. And so we already work on a weekly basis with you know, 80 percent of the entire conference, which makes it a natural that we are already reuniting, working on policy that matters to everybody in the entire conference. But this is a badly divided Republican conference. We've been hearing this for some time, and there's so much anger and ill will towards the people who started this, this including those eight Republicans who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy. Should anything happen to those eight members? Well, again, I'm not going to look backwards. I'm going to look forward. So we spent all of our time working what happened in the past. We're never going to be able to move forward. The American people right now know that we have a real problem in the world in Israel. What's going on over there is an atrocity. It's sad. It's, it's really scary, quite frankly, what could happen to the rest of the world if we don't get ahead of this. We need to get back in power, get the resolution passed for Israel, condemn Hamas as terrorists, what they're doing right now, shore up our defense so the rest of the world knows that we're serious about protecting the sovereignty of our allies and our friends and our own nation. And that's what we're going to do. And when you look at what's broken right now, it's to trust in each other. And we need to restore that. And the way you do that is you listen and you listen and you listen. And you put policy together to reunite the party. You mentioned Israel. But one of the big things you have to deal with was deciding how to move on Israel aid and Ukraine aid if you're a Speaker of the House. Will you agree, listen to what the President is calling for and what Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell is calling for to tie Israel aid to Ukraine aid and pass it together? We certainly know in the House, and, and I would argue in the entire Congress, Ukraine aid is, is controversial at times and really would just want to know where the money is going to be spent and what the strategy is, the mission is with the money. We do not need to bog down Israel aid in that debate right now. There's still $9 billion in aid for Ukraine sitting out there. We need to get Israel passed now, the Israel funding passed right now, as soon as we get the Speaker back in the House, hopefully tomorrow night. We get that done. And that way we send the message. We can have the debate on Ukraine. We can invite the President, State Department, and others to come and talk to us about the mission. And I think that will solve and, and cool a lot of, uh, of the negative aspects of the Ukraine funding so we can get moved down the road. You also voted against a short-term spending bill to keep a government open just a few weeks ago. Would you be open to passing a short-term spending bill to avoid a shutdown in mid-November? If we do our work, which is the, the day before I supported the CR that cut fund, uh, spending and it also funded the southern border. Uh, was, I thought we gave away too much to the Senate, to the, uh, Chuck Schumer in the Senate. We just did that, you know, you know kind of carte blanche. I think what we got to do is we got to work. We got to take back days that have been off. We got to schedule enough days here to get our work done. Put the DOD bill on the floor, get it passed, as I said. The other three that we passed, get those done, get them passed. Get them, get them signed into law, work our tails off to get to the end of the, of the November so, so not, But not a short-term bill, because that's where you're going to end up having a meet here, right? Well, but we'll have about 25 percent of the funding left to do it. If we do it, take uh, Speaker McCarthy's plan, actually, and put that in place, we will be where we need at, at the November 17th to have 25 percent of the funding that we will see our to get to where we need to be. So, so as, from what I understand, former President Trump has spoken to some of the candidates who are running. Have you spoken to him since you announced? I have. What was that conversation like? Well, he just wanted to know what was going on in the race. Obviously, nine people get in the race. Uh, he knew some of us at different degrees and levels. I've worked with the president you know, for years since I've been in Congress because he's been to Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is a state that voted all 77 counties for him twice. And so obviously we're very rich. We're the only state that did that, by the way. And so he's very familiar with Oklahoma and the members of the delegation there. Did you ask for his support? I did not. I'll let the president. I think he's going to set this one out. My, you don't think he's going to endorse anybody? I don't because all of us are friends of his. You know, he supported Jim because Jim was a longtime friend, a fighter for him early on, uh, what he's been doing in the judiciary. But if you notice that support of Jim, he said, I also like Steve Scalise and I like Kevin Hearn. So I, I think when you look at this now, he's going to let this play out. It's going to happen pretty quickly uh, tomorrow, so we'll see where it goes. And he, do you, you voted against certifying the 2020 election. Do you regret that vote? I don't. I, when you look at what I did, I said that Arizona and Pennsylvania should not have changed their voting laws without their state legislators being involved. If you look at since then, 
Pennsylvania's gone and changed a lot of those but problems. Did you talk to the president about the former president about that when you guys talked yesterday? I did not. He, he's looking forward as well. He, he knows he's in a great spot with this upcoming election, and he wants to talk about that. Okay. One last thing. If you get the nomination, will you try to get the 217 votes you need before forcing a vote on the floor, or will you go to the floor like Jim Jordan did? I think the consensus is, and I've talked to some of the other people that are running and, and others that are actually going to be the voting members, and we'd like to see a roll call vote in the basement so that we know this, and because the American people I don't want to see another thing that happened like last week with uh, Jim Jordan. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time, Congressman Hearn.